Comfort Solutions. Make the winning call. Blackbeard Marine, number one Yamaha dealer in the heartland. Riverwind Casino, still the one. River Spirit Casino Resort, your staycation destination. If you want to go all in, you want to be at Shock Talk Casino and Resort in Durant. Welcome to another edition of Barry Switzer Legacy of Oklahoma Football. Mark Rogers, Coach Switzer, and a couple of Oklahomans here tonight. Eddie Hitton from Lawton, Bobby Mormack from Ada, Oklahoma. Got this thing started in 1966 when uh, you arrived here. So tell me your first impressions of these guys, Coach. Well, uh, Mark, when 1966, I think Mike alluded to it. Anytime you get Texas beat you eight years in a row, there's going to be a ch coaching staff change. I'm surprised it didn't happen no sooner. Uh, Jim McKenzie was a great friend. He was my mentor. I coached with him at the University of Arkansas. We won 22 in a row at Arkansas and won a national championship. Jim McKenzie gets the call on January the 1st uh, after the game we'd beaten uh, uh, won the Cotton Bowl, and he uh, said, uh, Dr. Cross said, we're gonna, you have been selected as head coach of Oklahoma. Jim asked me after the game, do you want to go with me? And I said, yeah, I always wanted to go with you. Where are you going to go? So, obviously, uh, well, I arrived on January the 3rd and, and uh, stayed in the old Jones house, the dorm you guys lived in. I got up early the next morning. I'll never forget, there's Ben Hart in the shower with me. And Ben looked at me, Eddie, and says, you one of them new coaches because you knew I was too old to be in that room. I said, yes, sir. Hey, Mr. Eddie, uh, Mr. Uh, ben Hart, I'm here to help make you guys a winner again. And uh, so we did that. And these two guys are probably responsible for that more than any. Uh, my job as an as a offensive coach was uh, when I came here was to find out the, who the best players were on the offensive team. And I think uh, Bobby Warmack and Eddie Hinton can attest to it that Jim McKenzie came in and told us how it was going to be done. And right. Bobby and Eddie probably can tell you from the first time they met with Jim McKenzie, they told us how it was going to be. Let's start out with Eddie. Eddie, you uh, almost went to Oklahoma State. You're almost wearing orange <laughs> and black. Isn't that right? <laughs> yes, I did. Uh, it was amazing. You know, uh, coming out of high school and getting offered a lot of schools to go and play. And the recruit, they would come and recruit you, and they wouldn't bring you to campus and put you in a hotel. And I was impressed when I went to Oklahoma State because coming out of high school and you're standing on the, side, on the sidewalk, everybody will speak to you. And when you come to Oklahoma, they look at you and like, if you come here, you're gonna stay in the dorm here, and you're gonna eat right here in the cafeteria with all the athletes. It was kind of snobbish. And I'm like, I'm not going to school here. I mean, they, they don't act like they want to accept me. So I had to sign a letter saying I would go to Oklahoma State. And a friend from mine that went, was a couple years ahead of me down in Lawton, he calls me up the day before signing. He said, Eddie, I'm just kind of curious. Why are you going to Oklahoma State? I said, well, uh, he said, well, I noticed that ever since grade school, your color's been red and white. You like those colors, orange and black and white? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> and he said, he said, uh, do you like to get down as a running back on all fours and look like a lineman? And I said, uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> and he said, you've always been on a winning team, so why are you going to Oklahoma State? And the only thing that came out of my mouth, and after I heard it, it sounds so stupid, it's, I said, well, they got the best chicken fried steak I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I had to call up here in Oklahoma and ask for the scholarship. And the best move I ever made. No, that, that was something else. Now, tell me about your recruiting process. Ada had a, a strong lineage to the University of Oklahoma. It played some quarterbacks here uh, before you, you made the trip to Norman. We did. Ada had some great teams, state championship teams, unlike Eddie. Uh, I think I had one scholarship offer, and that was to OU, and I probably got the last scholarship that they had available. You know, back in that day, uh, they could offer as many scholarships as they wanted, and uh, they offered about 50, and I was probably number 50 on the list. But uh, I was just happy and thrilled to, to come to OU. There were two other guys along with me at Ada that uh, got scholarships, and uh, they lasted about one year and then left. So I was the only one out of that Ada group that, that hung on. Tell me how you got the nickname, The Wicked Worm. <laughs> well, Eddie might be able to tell you better than me, but... <laughs> But uh, we were getting ready to play Tennessee in the Orange Bowl. Right. And uh, they had a quarterback by the name of Dewey Warren, who was a great quarterback, and he had a nickname called the Swamp Rats. 
And so some of my teammates felt like their quarterback had a nickname. We've got to come up with a nickname for Warmack. So because of my elusiveness, I guess, <laughs> and being able to make people miss me, the wicked worm is what they call me, and it stuck. And people call me that to this day. That, I'll tell you what, since you mentioned that game, the Orange Bowl game against Tennessee, that, that was quite a taking off point for the program. You guys were an underdog in that game yes. and uh, got out to a big lead, Coach. And, 19 nothing. Yeah, jumped out in the first half, and, right. and uh, that has to be a really defining moment for both of your collegiate careers. Well, it, it was. We were an underdog in the game. Uh, first half was great. We jumped out to a 19-point lead. Eddie catches a touchdown pass. Uh, at halftime, it was like both teams went in the locker room, changed jerseys, and mm -hmm. came back out because the second half, we played terrible. Yeah. You know, we, uh, we gave it back to them, uh, and uh, they almost made a comeback all the way to the last play of the game where they uh, kicked the field goal. And they had a great field yeah, goal kicker. Right. He, might, he might have been All-American. I don't recall. But it was like a 43-yard field goal, and that pretty much was just a chip shot for him. Mm -hmm. And he missed it. It was wide right, and we, we won the ball game 26-24. So. Bobby Stevenson intercepted a pass, and only touchdown we scored in the second half and ran it back for a touchdown. Bobby right. made a great play, picked off a pass, and ran it back. Right. But it was a game we took control of early in and on, and it, we were 10-1. We If we had not lost to Texas that year, uh, it's the only game we lost. We were 10-1. and one. If we hadn't lost to Texas, we missed two field goals that day. Remember the year before, we kicked four field goals, right. made them all at yeah. the beat Texas and the Cotton Bowl and played great, played great defense. We were a great defensive football team with Granville Liggins and a, a, a bunch of guys who were really good players. But we were a good offensive football team, too. We could run the ball with Steve Owens and run shots that second year. Uh, good offensive line. Bob Kalsu was the only uh, NFL player that was killed right. in the Vietnam War. He was an old Kenny Mendenhall. Person. Kenny Mendenhall played one. for the Baltimore Colts for years. Calcio uh, uh, started for the Buffalo Bills as a rookie. We, we had a good football team. Steve Zabel was the fifth pick in the draft. He started for the Eagles. So our offensive football team, Owens was a first rounder, Eddie was a first rounder. We, had, we should have been better as a senior year of 69. It's my fault we didn't do as good a job. I take the blame for 69 not being as good a football team as we were in 68. Uh, when uh, in 67, when we were really good, and uh, these two guys were studs in that period. Let's, let's go back to that tech, that first Texas game. What was the, <laughs> the, the atmosphere around the locker room knowing that Texas had won all those games in a row and the intensity of that rivalry? That's a long streak to be winning in, in, in this Both history these guys the are true sophomores yeah, starting yeah. the first Texas game they're playing in. A bunch of those guys were. Well, you know, as a skinny kid from Ada, <laughs> starting my second game, I think it was, because Texas was like the third game of the season. We played them early. And uh, uh, going out to warm up, you know, it was just real exciting, going down the ramp and everything, getting out there warming up and all, seeing the crowd, you know, half orange, half red. We come back into the dressing room, and, uh, you know, we're just kind of hanging around, waiting to go back out for the coin toss and everything. And... I noticed Barry's over there. He's walking around. He's just looking real nervous, and you know I can't figure out what, what's wrong with him. And, uh, he ends up going into the bathroom. I think he threw up. I don't know, but <laughs> he, he comes back and he's still walking around. And finally, he comes over there and sits next to me. And I look at him. I said, uh, "Coach, relax. It's just a football game." Right. And he looked at me like. Warmack, you're nuts. This isn't Duncan High School. This is Texas. <laughs> and he was right. But we did go out and win that ball game 18-9, uh, and Eddie and I were sophomores, uh, had great games, mm -hmm. great experience. Uh, the experience going down the tunnel to the ball game is just mm -hmm. like nothing else. It's uh, really, really exciting. They, they were rookies going down the ramp. I tell, told them years later, I'd tell all my rookies, be careful where you walk because Bebo went down before you and I don't want you to have to come back and change your shoes. <laughs> and I, and I, I'm not sure these guys were covered in it too. <laughs> came back up after warming up. But, but uh, that was a great game. That put us on the way. We were 4-0. and you got to remember, the year before, they won only one, three or four games, right? We right. went 4-0 and that year. We we're 4-0 and at the start of the season and uh, we were the best I tell you what, we we could should have won the we should have won eight games that year. We snapped the ball over the head of uh, uh, 
uh, kicker, Wheeler, kicker. Gordon, Gordon Wheeler, Gordon Wheeler, Wheeler in yes, Colorado. Colorado. They cover yeah. it in the end zone for the touchdown. Right. That's the difference in the ball game. And uh, you'd hand the damn ball off to shots at OSU well, that, that sophomore year when he blows it in the end zone. And you do one of your high school moves. <laughs> you throw for a damn lead off. We were shocked. It you, wasn't your play. You made the damn play yourself trying to be a high school star. That, that, and, that's that's another story. But, but really, the <laughs> one loss that we you don't really want to talk about, right? <laughs> <laughs> the one loss that we really lost to was Notre Dame. Oh, that's a, oh, that yeah. was a butt kicking. That, that was that, they, they, they got Granville out of the game, and it was nothing, nothing for a quarter until Granville. Until Granny went out of the game, game, and then. Uh, they ended up beating us. Uh, I forget what. Yeah, Bob. Was, but but, it was, but well, it's a bunch <laughs> of big boys against. Yeah, well, yeah. You yeah. must remember. They said they told us that small and quick. Right. Anybody weighed over two hundred forty pounds was big and lazy. So we go to Notre Dame, and we see these huge guys, and we like, okay, we can take them. Uh, they're big and lazy. Yeah, we just know they are. <laughs> They hey, played with us the first half. Hey, yeah. listen, they, they were about five NFL stars in there. Alan Page, yeah, all that's right. Fame, Pete oh, Duranko, Pete uh, uh, the, the linebacker, what was his name? Lynch. Uh, Lance, Jim Lynch, yeah. all pro. Terry Henry. Terry Henry. They, yeah. they, they had a lot of great athletes, Jim yeah. Seymour and those guys. They, they were, we were out talented, but uh, we still, with Granville playing a good defensive scheme, we were stunned, gave them, gave them problems, but we lost Granny. We were, but that's the only game that we, we, we could actually, Jim McKenzie was coach of the year, but the other game that we won, not only beat Texas, we came back here and played Nebraska. And Nebraska, Bob Devaney had them on top in the league in that, back in the 60s, mm -hmm. late 60s. Nebraska was the team to beat, and they had great teams. We beat them on national television here at home 10-9. to 9. And Bobby Stevenson made another great play, laid out to block an extra point. His extra point wasn't he blocked. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Extra that, point. Uh, we beat them 10, was it 10-9? 10-9. It nine. was on uh, Thanksgiving Day, national TV. Nebraska had already won the Big 8 Conference Championship. They were undefeated. And uh, we go and, and play them. Uh, there was one play during that ball game. We, we, we had a new formation, a wide slot, really, that Eddie was kind of split out wide in the slot. And Barry apparently saw something from the press box that their safety was kind of not staying in the middle. So we called the post route to Eddie right through the middle, which really we hadn't worked on to my recollection <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and we just kind of drew it up uh, in the sand uh, before we went out there. And uh, Eddie catches a 48-yard touchdown pass, and we beat him 10-9. to 9. So right. that was the second. You know, Texas and Nebraska really were the two breakout yeah. games right. of that 66 season. It kind we of should have won the other two. If OSU and Colorado could easily won those, we'd been 8-2. and two. Really lost to Notre Dame, and uh, who in hell else we would have lost to? Colorado. We Colorado. lost to Colorado. But, but uh, we should have won those games. Jim McKenzie was voted uh, first year the uh, coach of the year. and uh, But it was a, but these guys had a great career for me uh, and for themselves. And uh, Bobby, you, you ended up going to the coaching profession. You weren't drafted to play pro football, but you coached for I, a decade. I coached. A lot of people for, don't know that. Remember yeah, I, that. I coached for a long time, and for uh, a sooner to end up. Down in Austin for the University of Texas, I coached down there for four years, and uh, actually I followed Fred Akers from Wyoming to Texas in 1977, and that happened to be Earl Campbell's That's right. senior year, and uh, we had inher inherited some really good talent that year, but in 77, Earl won the Heisman. He was a man among boys, he really was. He was the greatest football player I ever coached. He could run around people, through them. Uh, he was just a tremendous talent. But I had to ask him at practice one day, I said, you know, Earl, I, I know that, you know, OU recruited you as hard as Texas did. You know, what made you go to Texas? And he said, well, Coach, he said, uh, the night before signing day, whenever I got in bed, I prayed to the good Lord to give me some direction on uh, what I should do. And uh, when Barry heard that comment, he said, hell, if I'd have known that, I'd have been underneath his bed singing Boomer Soup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I told, for later years, I told Earl, I said, you know, Earl, if you'd come to Oklahoma at that time, I said, you know, we might have won a couple of national championships with you. I said, hell, we did anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but Eddie, I want you to tell what, how Jim McKenzie's first talk to the team inspired you. Uh, I've always known that Oklahoma had a tradition of winning. And they were in that lull period once uh, Bud Wilkerson and them ended up leaving. 
they start losing a little bit. And I came here my freshman year, and, and freshmen couldn't play on the varsity at all. And uh, I didn't like the atmosphere, and I was getting ready to leave after my freshman year. And next thing I know, they were bringing in new coaches. And I thought, these coaches got to win. And Jim McKenzie, soon he can't call a meeting. He said, I don't care if you're a freshman or you're varsity or you're holding dummies. Everybody got to start from the line and try to win the position. And that's all I needed because I've been trained, uh, coming from Lawton, to be a winner. I mean, that's where we won two national championships, I mean, two uh, state championships down in Lawton, and that's what I was used to. And when a coach says that, you get busy. Coach, tell me a little bit about his unique offensive talents. Well, first of all, his first round draft choice. And, well, we had two or three of them on the team. Uh, uh, when you look back, I think all that group of guys we had recruited and had here. But you got to remember, this was uh, when we came here with Jim McKenzie. Jim McKenzie was head coach only one year. When, uh, April the 26th of 1967, spring practice, Jim had a massive car in there and passed away. And then Chuck Fairbanks, who was on the staff, was named head coach. Chuck asked me to be assistant head coach and go back. I was coaching defense. I wanted to coach defense because I never thought I'd be a head coach. My not, you know, I was a linebacker, had to play both ways when I was in college. And uh, uh, so they, I, I wanted to be on defense because I felt that was the best chance for me to, to be a, a head coach. And uh, Chuck says, well, you got to go back to offense and be the offensive coach because I was the only one that knew really the playbook because uh, I'd coached the offense the year before for McKenzie. But McKenzie had asked me, coach offense for one year and I put you on defense the second year because you're the only one that knows how to run the Arkansas offense we're implementing when we got here. So but here I'm back on offense again. So that's when, uh, obviously, uh, I knew Bobby's talents were already there because I've been coaching him all year and his talents too, been watching him and coaching him on offense. I knew that these guys were, were winners. I mean, you know, we were going to win with them. They're good enough to win with. When I came here, I was kind of given the assignment Jim asked me to evaluate the quarterbacks because we didn't know who the quarterback was going to be because there's no, there's no returning guy. We had Gene Cagle from Lawton, was here was a year ahead of Bobby Warmack, Jim, uh, Berger. Jim Berger from Lindsay, and Shabon Dacon was the one that had all the pub, He had all the publicity, and uh, 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 everyone thought he would be the guy. But after watching a few weeks of workout, and, and I was impressed with Bobby Warmack. He was the most athletic of the bunch. Uh, wasn't stiff. He could do things. He could run and made quickness. He, he could, uh, you know, get in trouble and get out of it. He could scramble and do things. And, and he had the ability to throw the ball through a nice, good pass, catchable pass, and was accurate. So it wasn't any decision at all. Bob was our quarterback from the beginning and for three years starter for us. Uh, Eddie Hinton was just bigger, faster than anybody we had on the field. And I could run anybody chasing him. So Eddie was obviously a uh, a starter the first moment we saw him. And so as Granville was with nose guard on defense. What? That, you know, that's interesting that you mentioned. We'll let you comment on this, Bobby. Winning program high school, winning program high school, Super Bowl champion, Super Bowl champion. I mean, that winning that's bred into early on, those habits that are created carry on. I think that's one of the reasons why you guys started uh, all of that success. Mm. Yeah, I think without a doubt. I, and too, I, I think it was a program that was implemented when Barry and them came over in 66 and implemented an off-season program that really elevated the bar for all the players that really wanted to play football at OU, you had to make a commitment. It was, uh, uh, it wasn't easy. That off-season program, we lost 1,400 pounds collectively as a team. So if you weren't there to play and play at a high level at OU at that time, you, you weren't, you weren't going to play. Yeah, but you need to remember also what Jim McKenzie ended up saying besides everybody start from the same line. He looked at the dressing room. He looked at the dorms we're living in. He said, before you're able to play like a champion, you got to learn how to live like one. And he came in and he redid the locker rooms and he went in our dorms. He put carpet and lounging chairs. He said, now you feel like one. Now you understand what it's going to be like. I mean, he kind of set the precedent. Coach, what was that like that first first year. Do you have a little bit more liberty with being tough 
and, and implementing the, the I've never, I've program. never been, I was tough on Eddie because I was, <laughs> I was dumb. I was dummy. Eddie, I, I promise you, I was so stupid as a coach. Uh, we had in the fourth quarter class, and I'm going to tell you, these guys, were, we had a tough quarter, fourth quarter class. McKenzie won't be tough. You got to remember, Coach McKenzie played for Bear Bryant at Kentucky. We had a guy named Pat James here that played for Bryant in Kentucky. He coached for Coach Bryant for about 14 years at Alabama. And we were able to get him to come because he was a great friend with Jim McKenzie. They played together. So th th these guys were really hard-nosed, old Neanderthal fo football coaches. We had them doing stupid things like getting under <laughs> uh, the net on the floor of chicken wire and uh, 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 stick wrestling, trying to see who can win the damn stick wrestling, take it away from others. Well, how about that's got to do with football? You tear your damn shoulders up and your elbows. And, and, we were running sprints on those sprinting floors. Well, after we got through running our fourth season, you could run your hand smooth over that floor. We wouldn't get a splinter in it, but but because well, their butts doing seat rolls up and down that uh, uh, long building we had that stall on 17. But Eddie did everything so easy. <laughs> and everybody else, oh, blood and guts for other you guys. And, you know, did, Eddie just, just silk. You know, and everybody so it, was totally exhausted. We'd look over there at Eddie, and he was like a stallion. He's standing up there tall, not breathing hard, not sweating, and everybody else has just got their hands on their knees, just totally exhausted. And I think the coaches kind of used Eddie as a guideline as to whether we were running enough or not. They looked at Eddie, and, you know, he, he can run all day long. So let's run him some more. So anyway, Eddie was... They ever, athlete above all the rest of us. They ever tell you to was. shut it down, Eddie? <laughs> so after all tell this training, you know, wait, you wait, wait, tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> after all this, right? And he said how hard it was. So he walks over to me after practice, and I walk over and he said, uh, he said, Eddie, you know, you're a gifted athlete. Now I'm running just like everyone else is. And uh, life sometimes gonna get really tough for you. And I'm looking at him, and I'm, of course, I'm giving respect, and I'm not saying what's on my mind. I'm saying, <laughs> is this man an idiot? What do you mean life's going to get tough for me? He said, I'd like for you to run a couple of laps afterwards. And I just asked him, what is that going to prove? And he looked at me with them. I said, tell you what, to satisfy you, I'm going to do it six times. And every time I would run around and past him, I kept looking at him in the face, and I kept calling him every name except the child of God. <laughs> and to keep my mind off the pain. And afterwards, I, and I walked over to him and I said, so what did that prove? And he looked at me like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> and I went and passed out in the dorm for like 16 yeah, hours, yeah. but he didn't apologize later. Yeah, I was you Were you running? Eddie the, no, he didn't run. Eddie. Okay, he was running. He was, I was running. You were just he standing, standing there looking at Eddie when he were Yeah, like, Eddie made everything look effortless, and I never had an athlete look like that, so I thought he wasn't giving good effort. <laughs> he right. didn't hurt more. <laughs> he didn't hurt enough for me. <laughs> so, but anyway, it was stupidity on my part. But anyway, I met it, and, uh, but... Uh, junior year, we were really a great football team when they're juniors, and that's the year we went 10 and 1 and beat Texas and should have won a national championship. Uh, our second year here with the guys that are already here, because you had to play with what was there. Freshmen didn't even play then, and these guys uh, were good enough. And I think about the, you know, we talk about Jimmy Files. He was a, right. No one wanted him. He was the first round pick of the New York Giants, that's the middle correct. linebacker. Right. Uh, he was the 10th pick. Zabel was the fifth pick. Uh, Eddie was the first pick. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we had. Uh, you know, Owens was the first rounder. We, Kenny Mendenhall. Kenny Mendenhall. We, we had a lot of guys. Bob, Bob Kalsu, second round pick. Uh, so we, we had a lot of guys who were just good players. We came in here and they started believing that the game's played from the neck up anyway. And uh, of course, I like for the rest of that 10% to be 6'6 and 255, <laughs> 260, run 4'5. But they really. I think uh, kids started believing they can win, and, uh, right. and then we uh, approach it that way. And uh, tell them about the Missouri game. I got you get your oh. Eddie said I always <laughs> had him, right, I motivated him. Uh, I tell him story. I already kind of had a vision of where I was headed when I got to university. I wanted to graduate in four years, and I was going to play pro football. And so we get ready to play Missouri, and of course, you know, we practice all week getting prepared for the team. Team, we're going down a ramp. And Barry walks over to me, and I never felt like I had to be motivated. I knew what I had to do. And he says, you know, we play in Missouri today. And I kind of looked at him and said, <laughs> duh. <laughs> and he said, um, they got an all-American defensive back 
on that team. I, yeah, Kurt, seen him in film. His name is Roger Worley, where is number 22. I said, yeah, I, I know who he is. He said, he's going to kick your butt today. <laughs> and I, all of a sudden, it's just, I went, my mind just, just blew. I just went, what? The coach thinks somebody's going to defeat me? And then he, he ended up saying, and he's white, Eddie. So it just exploded. <laughs> and I returned kicks and punts. And it seemed like when it kicked off to me, it looked like the whole field opened up. And I'm running the ball. I'm screaming his name. I'm looking at 22. I don't care about the other players. I know I can run right or left them. I'm going to run right into him. I got the ball. And they end up scoring. So the whole game, I'm constantly on offense. I'm hollering his name across the line. Roger, I'm coming again. I'm coming again. And he kept looking like, is something wrong with you? So we get that year, they end up taking the top athletes around college to play in all sports. We won game. the game, too. Yeah, we won the game. <laughs> they, take the, they took the, the top athletes to play in the All-Star game of Chicago. We're going to play the team that won Super Bowl, which was the yeah, Jets right. that year. And we had practice up in Chicago, and they tell all the defensive backs, get in front of the defense, the receivers to give them the look that they're going to get when we play against the Jets. And every time Roger would come up, he would stand 8 to 10 yards back. And they said, Roger, get on front of him. him just go and get him, give him that look. He said, mm-mm. He said, no. He said, I can play him back here. He said, no, we need to get. And I remember the game. And I thought, whoa, coach, time out. And I went over to him. I said, look, this is what happened. My coach kind of got me hyped up. I never knew nobody could do that. And I'm not crazy. Okay, just <laughs> give me a look. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's where that happened. But uh, coach was the first one <laughs> coach ever could motivate me that way. Roger Worley had a long pro career, too. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he's he's a great player. In the Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that's I, absolutely right. Tell me what it was like to coach against Oklahoma at Texas. Well, it was, it was difficult. I, I remember uh, standing up in the press box before the game, and when they struck up Boomer Sooner, you know, I, I almost stood up right. and started singing right along. But it, it was, uh, you know, it was different. Uh, you have to be loyal to the one that, that uh, you're coaching to and uh, coaching with or coaching for. And uh, we had a good team that year in 77. We had some great players. OU had some great players as well. Uh, we actually won that game the, the first year that I coached against OU, so I kind of felt like I'd earned my spurs as a coach at that time. But uh, Texas was a great place, great tradition, great facilities, great players, great coaches, and so forth. So. Uh, you know, it, it was an honor to be there. If you're going to be there, you might as well win the game. I right? want Eddie to tell, because he's told me this story, when he got in pro football, when Eddie got to pro football. Yeah. You know, remember, he's the number one draft choice, Baltimore Colts. They're world champions. They are the best up there. Johnny Unitas and uh, really great yeah. defensive players. I, I played with a couple of the, that were playing on defense. Bill Ray Smith played with me right. in Arkansas. They had really good players, and, and I knew most of them. And uh, he gets there, and he's in the league for the first time, and Eddie is starting for him as a flanker, or splitter and a flanker, right. and uh, he's going to get to play against Willie Brown, who is the d defensive corner. So I want you to tell him the Willie Brown story. Well, first of all, <laughs> when you get into pros, you got to know who's the best and what. And my ideal is I want to play against the best. So you figure that if you figure out who the best defensive backs are, those are one you really plan for because everybody else is going to be watching you. And there was two of them. Dallas Cowboys had a defensive back named Mel Renfro. And then Oakland had uh, Willie Brown, which these guys were all pros. And I kind of studied them for a year. They didn't realize it. And the biggest fear for an all-pro is a rookie who's unknown. They don't have no film on Because an all-pro do the same thing consistently well. The thing that confuses him, when a rookie comes up, he don't know where he's going half the time, and so he certainly don't know where he's going. But I always figured that I had four things, advantages over them I was going to use against them. I figured I was stronger than they were, I was faster than they were, I was quicker than they were, and this is in my mind. And the fourth, I always felt I'm smarter than they, they were. So back then, they played you man on man. And every receiver I saw play against them, they always tried to get away from them. And I thought, well, I'm the same size as they are, and I figured I got just as much speed. What happens if I just run into him and use my form to push him off me? 
well, that's what I would do in the first play. And they look at me like, you got to, I said, I would say a little word like, it's going to be an exciting game today. <laughs> <laughs> I've been studying you for a year and you've just been watching me for one week. Right. And you come back with them with something with your quickness and then you come back with your speed and um, I know where the ball is always going so you try to get to that place. So, explain to me the leadership characteristics of Johnny Unitas. I mean, obviously, he was one of the best throwers. He was truly, time. truly amazing, probably any quarterback that ever played. My rookie year... I go into the huddle, and I've always been told, no one talks in the huddle but the quarterback. I mean, that's well, I'm trained that way. I'm hearing these veterans talking to each other. And I'm looking at them like, whoa, is that what they do? I, I'm not saying a word. And the guy that I'm replacing was Jimmy Orr from down in Georgia. He'd been there 12 years. They bring me in to take his place. So we're on the sideline, and Jimmy says to me, look, Rook, Anytime you know you can beat your man out on the field, tell Johnny in the huddle. Back then, you saw when they got in the huddle, well, the quarterback, you remember when you stand up, look like he's looking at defense, then he get down on one leg? Well, Johnny's waiting on, he already got the play my, uh, in mind, he's gonna play, but he's listening to one, what player is getting the best of his man. If the right tackle or the left tackle or the guard, where we're gonna run the ball, if the tight end is doing something, or even if the right receiver is gonna end up, uh, if he's beating his man, He's going to call that play. So I'm thinking that Jimmy Orr is telling me something to make me look bad, you know, because I'm taking this play. So I'm not, again, I've been brainwashed. Nobody talks in the hole but the quarterback. And this is God that I've been in mind. And he's always Mr. United to me, never Johnny. So <laughs> he called, gets to the sideline and Johnny says, uh, he walks up to Mr. United and says, what can you do out there? Uh, he's talking to me. Anything. <laughs> Wrong answer. He walks and his nose about to touch mine. He said, God darn it. They don't pay you the money for me to figure out, can you run inside the man? Can you run outside the man? Can you run past him? Well, the defensive back was playing me way inside. I can get a first down outside all day long. I'll run past him. And he said, tell me in the huddle. More tears come out of here. And I'm like, oh my God. It was his way of knowing that your mind was always in the game. It was really amazing. The second year, 85% of the passes he threw, I called him in the huddle. I mean, but that's what everybody did on the team. They worked as a unit, and probably every athlete on that team could play more than two or three positions if we needed. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's a pretty Eddie, impressive squad. Eddie's claim to fame was that he caught Johnny Unitas' last touchdown pass. Oh, tell me about that. Well, there's... They had had new ownership of the team, so they was revamping the whole team. And Johnny Unitas was the last great one on the team, and they told him, said, you will not play the rest of this year. Okay, and we're going to pay you. You'll be on the sideline. Well, early in the season, I tore a groin muscle. I'm trying to heal. Got new ownership, and I'm thinking constantly, I got to show them I can still play. I'm in my leg. You're the heel. And going to, last game of the season, we're playing Buffalo. We're ahead of the 17 to nothing. Fourth quarter, about four minutes left to go in the game. It was really like a Cinderella story. All of a sudden, the crowd started yelling and standing up, Unitas, we stand, Unitas, we stand. And some players, we looking at each other like, what's going on? And all of a sudden, we look up, there was a plane flying above with a banner saying, Unitas, we stand. All of a sudden, he's running on the middle field. And we looking at each other like, the old man has lost him. He's not supposed to be out there. <laughs> and he stops in the middle of the field. He points over to me. He said, are you ready hitting? I said, well, yeah. And I just run on the field like I'm a crazy. I didn't ask the coach or anyone else. Told the receiver, you got to get out. And he looks at me and he said, I'm going to throw that pattern until you're going across the field. Are you ready? Said, yes, sir. He threw it and it's like a duck. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God. So fast I'm going to get. The whole game is going to be over. No one is going to see what I can do. And the, end of the defensive back end up intercepting it. And so much happens in a split second as an athlete. Sometimes you react and not even know what's going to happen. I reach over his shoulder, snatch the ball from him, outmaneuver four players like I was possessed, run 68 yards, and I'm standing in the end zone. Now, at the Canton Hall of Fame, they got this, and the guy's narrating it. And he says, Johnny United's touchdown pass go all through his accolades and said, 68 yards touchdown. But they never said who caught it or ran it. But I know. 
I never mentioned Eddie's name. That's right. <laughs> and what are you doing today, Bobby? Tell me about where you, what are you doing today. Uh, I am living in the Dallas area, retired, and uh, just kind of enjoying life. Uh, my wife and I are playing pickleball. <laughs> pickleball. Uh, pickleball. Pickle Nobody's ball. ever heard of pickleball. I hadn't uh, up until about three years ago, and ever since then, my wife and I have been traveling around playing tournaments and playing pickleball. It's it's a great game for seniors who want to remain a little competitive and stay in good shape and so forth. Play a little golf, do a little fishing, and watch as much OU football as I can and come back and see my old buddies right. as often right. as I can. Old cowboy, tell us about what you've done all your life. <laughs> People don't know this guy is a real cowboy. Uh, a weekend cowboy. Uh, when I was five years old, all I ever wanted was a horse, and which I never got, okay? Until I was 40 years old, I ain't no buying one. And my mother obviously knew more about my future than I did. When I was five, she gave me a football and a football outfit. And I have written underneath it, all I want is a horse. I want a football and a football outfit. Well, for 20-some years, I was a home builder and retired in 08. And a couple of years, I didn't do anything. And I felt like, like self-worth. I've been working all my life, being productive. And I'm thinking, what, where can I make a difference now in this time of my life? And I decided that um, I went to be a school bus driver. And knowing that 65% down where I am, I live in the hill country north of San Antonio. And 65% of the adults there that have children, they don't have a really strong male figure in their lives. Well, they see me every day. And of course, I got my rules and either they abide by them or they find another way of transportation. That school bus could be a pretty tough environment, yeah, too. Yeah, right? He's got great stories about yeah. kids riding his school bus, how he's changed lives. He sat on there and he watched and evaluated in his mirror. He saw the bullies. He saw That's the right. guys of the weak people. saw the girls and what they... He, all of a sudden, second, third day, and he's driving the bus. He just pulls about a mile away from the school, pulls over the side, stops the bus, and gets up and says, I need to introduce, I introduce myself to you. My name's Eddie Hinton. See, that Super Bowl ring. I played football at the University of Oklahoma. That says I was an all-pro receiver. And I want to tell you, when you ride my bus, you're going to do what I tell you to do. <laughs> and he took, he had already figured out a seating order, right? right. And here's the seating order. He took the bully right. and made him sit by the week up front. Here. That's right. And he took the girls, the ones that were all up, made them sit up right up very close and told them, be quiet. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, they started calling him Mr. Eddie. That's what Mr. Did. Eddie. From then on, they all loved Eddie. he would come and talk to him about his problems and visit with him. And I've yeah. said, we need to do a movie called Riding with Mr. Eddie. <laughs> because Eddie's doing it. Because they got back when he signed up for the job, the guy said, well, you're overqualified. He says, no, yes, I'm not overqualified. He says, this is what I want to do. He says, I want to help young people, and I think I can help young people do yeah. this. And uh, that's what Mr. Eddie does. Besides riding a horse on the weekend, <laughs> cowboy. By the way, he's a cutting horse guy. Uh, he, was, uh, Houston, he was president of the Houston Cutting Horses, weren't you? Well, no, no, it was the Houston Alumni, Alumni Association. Okay. Yeah, not the Cutting Horse Association. What did you do? Cutting horses or what? Was it cutting horses? Well, I do teams. Team, no, girls do barrels. <laughs> <laughs> team sorting and team pinning I've done for years. Uh, with my horse. That's better than bear back. He has an interesting Bull career, yeah. an interesting life. I'm telling you, <laughs> right. Eddie's, Eddie's special. All hey, of them are. It's been fun catching up with you guys. Really enjoyed it and uh, sharing these memories. And uh, I think it's been fun for everybody here. So uh, look forward to seeing you guys again soon. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you for coming, guys. Love you all. Love you, Bobby. Eddie, you're the best. All right. Comfort Solutions, make the winning call. Blackbeard Marine, number one Yamaha dealer in the heartland. Riverwind Casino, still the one. River Spirit Casino Resort, your staycation destination. If you want to go all in, you want to be at Choctaw Casino and Resort in Durant, 